Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Pat Monahan. Hey Dave. Yes. I didn't Can we talk about here. something? Jeff. And we need to go quickly because Can it's... I just finish getting dressed real quick? No, we don't oh. we don't have time. Okay. How'd you it's, get in? As much as I'd like for you to have clothes on right now, we okay. don't have time because okay. go, it's go. gonna be a, I can power through. Can it's power gonna through. be a busy summer of the big three, Dave. Okay. Sports, yep. beach days, and non stop sunshine. sunshine. Yeah, you yeah. know me. I know what you're gonna say. But listen, knock around, right? Mm-hmm. Has the sunglasses you need to make the most of Ooh. it. They've been making high quality shades yep. that don't break the bank since 2005. Mm-hmm. And they've actually been our personal go to for years. With over 25 different frame styles, 25, John, there's something for the whole family, especially mm-hmm. if you have 25 people in your immediate family. And if you do, yeah. you need to keep listening to this podcast because <laughs> you need help. We can save you money. Including tons of kids' pairs, too. Whether you're looking to rock some red, white, and blues, see what that is. Oh, because of like our na- nation's yeah, colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rep U.S. soccer or USA basketball during the summer games, mm-hmm. Olympic games are coming, or throw on a timeless pair for those backyard Barbies. That's barbecues. Or, you mm-hmm. know, if you have some Barbies. Barbies that you I don't really with. want to talk more about that. <laughs> Knock around has you covered. Dave, did you know that all their lenses have UV 400 protection <laughs> with polarized adult pairs that start at 28 bucks? Jeez, how Dave? do they make money, John? Right. You can get a few pairs and, like, leave one in your car, yep. toss them in your beach bag, yep. lend, loan them to a friend. They're so cheap, you can loan them to a, an enemy. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter at this point. Right? John, if you see me cooking burgers and hot dogs on the grill, wearing my brand new red, white, and blue knockarounds, mm-hmm. please don't bother me. Oh. Because it means I'm in the BBC. The, oh, is that the barbecue zone? That's exactly what that means. Okay. And I cannot be and disturbed. you can't be disturbed. All right, it's going to be tough because I want to get near every knockaround pair that I see. But listen, Dadville fans, don't squint through this summer's festivities. Check out knockaround.com and use the code DADVILLE15 for 15% off your order. That's DADVILLE15 for 15% off your order at knockaround.com. Don't bother, Dave. Get the BBC. <laughs> I just want to say collectively, we're yes. stoked to have you. Thank on. you for this coming. Is like, on. Cool. thanks. This is we paid a lot of people a lot of money for this, and so I'm really, I'm really <laughs> glad. We're ready to. Recoup. We're glad to have you on. I'm a hundred percent sure you did not. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, if you did, Dave, you should ask people more questions because that's not. Yeah. Well, I'm here. Um, so we start Dadville uh, every episode with what we call the brag sheet, and that's just um, you know a little getting to know you um, for those two people who haven't heard of you or train that are alive in the world today who I assume are under a year old each which would explain why um but here it is here's your life this is your life okay so from Erie Pennsylvania which you're our first Erie uh native that's been on which is exciting in its own way um originally this was there's a lot of fun facts in here so originally started a Led Zeppelin cover band called Rogues Gallery which is a Amazing band name, by the way. I, I didn't mean, even know is... what it meant for the first three years I was <laughs> You in. don't know. You can't know. I think your first band, you can't... If you can explain what it yeah, means, it's, it's the wrong title. Right. It needs to be some... Um, yeah, so uh, then formed Train in San Francisco in 94. Yep. Debut album was released in 98, which I know that album so... Well. Actually, no lie. It, it, completely unrelated to this podcast. I pulled out CDs, like I randomly went into my basement and just pulled out all my like Case Logics. Yeah. And the first train album was there. And I put that thing in so fast oh, cool. and like completely went back. I forgot how many jams you'll have. One of the album, coolest things I ever heard about that album was that back in those days, Keith Urban was supposedly uh he listened to that album like every night on really tour. yeah i was always psyched about isn't that. that I like as a musician believe. there is kind of no like that is the mountaintop if i heard that some yeah, I, like peer that i revered so much there somebody told me like yeah he, he listens to your music before he goes on stage every night i'd be like that's yeah, yeah there's nothing better than pretty, that. Uh, that was pretty cool yeah yeah you know, it's a weird step down, <laughs> by the way, is I had a buddy literally yesterday send me a video of someone tuning, I, I think it was Jason Aldean's front of house was tuning the system, the show to one of my songs. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's and so And that's cool. a really interesting no, that's text. that's the mountaintop for awesome. the musician like, who is now a front of house engineer. <laughs> that's right. 
<laughs> that's as good as it gets. I'm always like, that's such an interesting thing to get attention. I think about. that's pretty cool because my guy tunes the room with uh, Sade. Steely Dan. Oh, oh, it's either it's either Steely Dan or Sade. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's, it's really cool. Too. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay, so um, so debut album in '98, Train uh, drops Jupiter. Album was released in 2001. I didn't realize it was three years later. Uh, sold over three million copies. Just a small. <laughs> Uh, I also love that our producer Jason just put in all caps Chuck Lavelle which I just watched his documentary and found out he played on that song which to me was like such a cool full circle yeah I it's kind of why the song did well because Chuck gives he gives music a whole new bounce it's a Man. different kind of vibe yeah yeah, it's that that uh, the documentary the tree, tree Man or something whatever it's called is yeah. so cool but right. it was just like his the business that thing they his do, like, business a, card is wood yeah it's, I mean it's, it's amazing really cool. So it released 11 studio albums, sold more than... Dude, this is insane. 50 million albums worldwide. 32 songs on Billboard's 100. It's hard not to laugh. At this. And 28 albums on the Billboard's uh, 200 albums. Structures is crazy. Won two Billboard Music Awards. Won three Grammys. Song of the Year for ASCAP Pop Awards. Artist of the Year Radio Music Awards. I mean, that's well done, my friend. You have... You have made a stamp I, one question i always love to ask after reading that is like so like 15 year old pat monahan if he if he like you know if i could go back in time and i'm like look man i'm gonna read what you accomplish and i read that to him like 15 year old pat is like what how is he looking at that like yeah it's about time or is he like whoa or like where is he with that uh, you know i probably wouldn't have thought it was enough um because wow. It's never enough. Mm-hmm. Like, there's never, uh, yeah. you know, it's a strange, weird thing because those accomplishments aren't even a thing, really. They're they're like, all they are are ways to continue to make music. Like, when, when Meet Virginia yeah. did well, there was an army of people fighting to get that song on the radio. And mm. I didn't realize that until it was later in the game where it was like, the reason that we're all fighting to sell a million of these albums is so that Columbia Records notices that you're really an artist because mm. we were on mm. a sub label to Columbia and then we can continue to make records. And then the Drops yeah. of Jupiter album was next and we wrote the entire album, <clears throat> excuse me, and didn't have a single for them. And my mom had passed away and like mm. three months of not having a single for them, I woke up from a dream and wrote Drops of Jupiter in 15 minutes Jeez. because my mom Jeez. obviously sent me this song because mm-hmm. I just wrote it down. It was like it wasn't even me. And then that gave us a chance to go around the world. And then the world wow. was so big that we were on the road for most of you know years. And then you get burnt out. And then you start trying to write hits. So you, you make lesser music. And mm-hmm. and then you make a solo record because you hate your band. And that record does <laughs> And then you get the band back together. And, you know, you have some luck with some songs because, you know, you, you just, for whatever reason, the desperate part of you has to get something. And yeah. then, you know, you just figure out how to live a better life like make better mm. choices and uh, now my band or my favorite people were like family it's uh you, know, you just try to change through time where accomplishments are less than the people that are around you yeah yeah man that is That's well said. what a beautiful do, do you feel like there's anything you would go back and tell like young pat about those things you know i would say hey like hey man heads up you know you're you're going to start drinking wine again when you're 45. So maybe drink less. That would be my only tip. You start with that. I would start with that one. I like I like how that's like, it's just enough information to get young Pat to sort of lean in, but then you vanish and he's like, mm. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, my father, my father was really a funny guy. Uh, you know, mm. Pennsylvania guy, uh, not uh, wildly mm. successful, and he <laughs> he would say to people, "Why don't you save your precious advice and cut me a check?" <laughs> 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 so I don't really have any advice for people because that, that was always his viewpoint of people's advice is uh, I'd I'd rather just be able to pay rent. So your dad, he was a musician as well, yeah. He was a drummer in like World War II, but his 
his love for music was really something else. Like, uh, every day I would come home from, you know, kindergarten or even before that, and he'd be, uh, you know, with a glass of bourbon, listening to jazz, asking me if I could wow. keep time with, like, take five. And oh, wow. and I think oh, I was man. four, and I was able to keep time. And he was like, wait, what? Because it flips, you know. It goes... Oh, the five four is a killer. It's a killer. So you, So the house, the vibe of the house was you would come home and music was just there not as an occupation necessarily but as a passion yes and my siblings i was the last of seven kids they'd all be upstairs in the attic you know smoking weed listening to the beatles and zeppelin and uh chris wow. christopherson mm-hmm. it was a wide net i think the first thing that i loved outside of what was in my house was michael jackson uh wow that, that was just really cool and the, i think the reason i started to sing was because I think I was in seventh grade in a carpool coming back from basketball practice, which I was not good at. And there was a Michael Jackson song. The Michael Jackson song was on, and uh, everyone in the car was singing, including me. And then they all stopped and looked at me, and they were like, what? Really? And I was like, oh, I think I might have just found something. Really? That's so wow. fascinating. It, it was obviously basketball. You're hearing this voice <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, it's other people here and be like, no, 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 that's not normal. Your voice and does when not your sound peers, like, our voice. like you, like you talked about your peers, you know, when your peers think it's okay, that's totally. when it yeah. starts to click. So was that was that the bug? Was that moment the moment you're like, I need to lean into this? Yeah, because I I played drums already. I wanted to just be a drummer. It seemed like a a, a way to kind of disappear a little more. I was pretty. Mm. I I was not a kid who raised his hands in class, you know, like I, I wanted mm. to be invisible. Yeah. So drums seemed like a better invisible cloak than being a lead singer. So, uh, but then girls seemed to like singing. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll <laughs> do that. You're like, I want to be visible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, to be visible. Yeah. I mean, you have such a, I mean, your voice is so unbelievable. It's, it's amazing to think that there was moments where you're like, I don't know. And then all of a sudden you turn into this. You're such a great singer. Well, that's super nice. Thanks. Incredible My voice. son is 12, and he really is a special singer. Like, and he's oh, wow. got <clears throat> he's got so much more courage. Like, uh, he just mm. did. He does a school of rock program. I think you yeah. have that in Nashville. Right oh yeah, street. yeah, yeah. And yeah. he he's 12, and he's in bands with all the seniors in high school. Really? Because he's wow. he's a different level of singer. And they're, you know, good guitar players at this point, yeah. these seniors. And so he was in a Led Zeppelin school of rock band uh, just recently and killed. I mean, the that immigrant is no song small feat. and uh, trampled underfoot. Good. And Jeez. it was wild. Okay. Yeah, he's really good. Of course, he's, he's pre-puberty, so he's just crushing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, all the high notes are nothing. Like, we're going to go sing the national anthem together, and we're going to do it in C sharp. Come on. Oh. Because I can do the first half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. he'll and then do the second off. half, and it's like nothing for him. So uh, I, I want to ask about that. I mean, we had this slated for later on in the interview, but you, I watched a video of the two of you singing together with, I think it's on a, it's on a, a cruise or something We like that. Are Family. Oh, oh, yeah. We were on a TV show, too, called We Are Family. That, but uh, yeah, we, he, he's an artist on our cruise yeah. we do every other year. So I'm particularly interested in this because I, I have two girls... 11 and almost nine and they're both getting into music they're you know there's a piano in the house they're both starting to sing and do musical theater and they love it and my oldest yeah. daughter is actually at school of rock down the street as well cool so yeah, great. i'm particularly interested in how you handle this with rock your son because you know this is music is what we do but we're also their dad and so i'm like i am couple things i'm like how much do i jump in here how much do i coach or how much do i just listen because i do have things to say here you know like i have i know a thing or two about singing and and playing the piano and it's stuff not like a that. hobby but yeah, yeah i know but i'm also i don't want to jump in there and micromanage and have them like how do you navigate that i i wait to be asked huh which is hard that's great 
It can be because, you know, a lot of these teachers are 20-year-old kids that are, you know, probably going to leave in six months because, the mm-hmm. you know, there's another adventure they want to have, which is right. proper and, and makes sense. And so... And I feel for that teacher as you're, like, waiting in the hall and they're like, yeah. I'm going to teach well, about and, my hands and, on how and, to you know, sing. they're doing their best as 22-year-old kids or whatever. Yeah. And then they you know, my son will come home with all this vocal advice that he's been given, and I just go, okay. (laughs) Oh, wow. And if he asks me what I think, then I'll tell him. I'm thinking if I'm a 22-year-old kid, and I'm kind of like, I got the world on the string, you know, just, I can can play every Jimmy, you know, give me a lick, I can play it, or I can sing it, right? But then I I look up and see that you're the dad, I'm like, "Mm, hmm, okay, yeah, no, I've got, he's, no, I'll teach him. Everything. I'd just be like, oh boy. Yeah, I feel this, for that I mean, teacher. Do, do, do you, <laughs> I'm just like, do you walk in with any sense of sort of gravity of like, you know, I, I, I I'll tell you, my struggle would be not to sort of flex. I'd just be the dad that's like, I don't know if you guys know this. Actually, <laughs> professionals. <so>. Yeah, <laughs> you'd, you'd pull an anchor man. I'm a oh, very I'm, important. I'm kind of a big I'm, deal. I'm a very big deal. Yeah. <laughs> I would have a really hard time not doing that. I mean, just kind of like, you know, because this is the water you swim in. No, I go. I go back to my grade school uh, disappearing act. I, yeah, uh, I, I don't <laughs> just like. I don't need to be a big part of that. Uh, if they, so there was one particular thing where my son is in choir at school. Uh, they're going to a private school for the first time. My uh, daughter is a. She's going to be a sophomore in high school, and my son will be in seventh mm-hmm. grade. And we went to a choir concert, and I just had so many questions. Um. Hmm. Because I saw a room full of people, parents and kids, kind of bored. And I was like, wow, that can't be. Because, you know, most high schools are driven by sports. And if you're yeah. going to include the arts, then you should inspire other students that wouldn't consider coming to the school to come to this school because of how bad wow. your art program mm-hmm. is. Right. So my questions were less, you know, let me take it over and more, why are these songs the ones that are chosen? Why Why is this wow. the program? Is uh-huh. it because it's a Christian-based school? Is there a prerequisite to you have to do this many of these classics and do these have to be religion-oriented? And the answer to all the questions were no. And then I was like, huh. well, then the kids need to be more involved because if they're excited, then their parents are excited. And yeah. then the whole program yeah. starts to shift. Yeah. And the next concert was awesome. Really? They did Hey, oh, they did so hey cool. Soul Sister. They did, you know, songs that the kids wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And, and it was just a, it was 10 steps forward. And all I had to do was ask questions. So sometimes instead of, you know, thinking you know everything, just... I didn't know any of the answers, so uh-huh. I just yeah. asked what 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 they could do. But, but it shows it's really cool that that is one of those cool moments in your life where your expertise can actually help in a way. The kids to get to make something. The better. kids know what's cool, and and yeah. let me tell you, I don't like I lo- I love <laughs> hip hop and listen to it, but you know I can't go in there and be like, hey, you guys need to do a Kendrick song, you know, like right, right, <laughs> right, right. Well, what's cool about that? Like, it makes me think of. You know, I I started playing piano when I was four, and there was music to me was like the the, the songs I was taking at my lessons every Thursday night until I heard Ben Folds Five, and then Ben Folds Five opened. I was like, oh, there's a guy, there's like this nerdy guy playing piano on X One Hundred Three, like, and he's touring with Weezer or something. Like, it's cool. Like, and that could be that night that concert could be that moment for so many of these kids where they're like, Oh no, no, no. Yeah. There's this whole other world to music. You know, we toured with Ben folds five. Oh, wow. and it was really fun to watch those guys. They oh were gosh. a really good band, like oh, yeah. three piece band that just sounded like there were nine guys up there. Yeah. And I was always impressed, but they did one thing that I always was disappointed in and they didn't play brick. Really? Oh. Which was their, their hit. Yeah. And mm-hmm. one night they played Brick because they had some record executives in the building. Yeah. And their fans booed. For, while they played And I was like, whoa. 
Like I dreamed my whole life that someone would sing songs back to me that I wrote mm -hmm. and right. their fans were like, no, 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 you got to play the, the cuts off the album that we want right. to hear, not right. the hit. And so that's, that's not just them. There's, there are a lot of bands that, uh, and I think Ben probably plays it now. I haven't seen him in a long time, but, uh, I was always like, man, I want to hear that song 10 times a day, totally. not, not just once. Isn't it interesting, too, that their fans would be like, See, oh, I get man, this. this. And again, I don't want to jump ahead. And I, Dave and I have this nice, neat schedule here. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing with that. That kind of doesn't surprise me because I think you get you. You're just try any kind of success. Any song that you can get on the radio at any yep. whatever is lightning in a bottle. I mean, any traction is lightning in a bottle. And then you have this song that blows up and then i think for the artist and of course like like you're saying in this this story like even with the fans sometimes the relationship with that song or whatever it is that tv show if you're an actor or what that movie it can get complicated you know you've had many many of these but the one i want to talk specifically about is drops of jupiter because it's i don't know that a song can get bigger than that and I think oftentimes, I know in my experience, in my little world, my relationship with whatever the song is that kind of brought people to the party becomes yeah. complicated. You know what I mean? And I can, I think a lot of times you can become resentful. I've become resentful of some songs that I, I know people, it's like, you're just here because you want to hear that one song. What about the other hour and a half that I'm doing here? Like, and I can... Mm -hmm. I can, you know, it's just complicated. So I'm curious, what has your relationship been like, you know, specifically with Drops of Jupiter and maybe some of the other massive, massive hits that you've had? What, what has that arc kind of been like? You know, they're, they're, you're right. Like you, when you have a hit and, and they want to hear the hit, uh, I still joke these days when we do a private show and, you know, we'll start the show with Calling All Angels and, you know, play, uh, you know, some of these songs that, that are pretty familiar. And then we'll start Hey Soul Sister and I'll make a joke like, oh, you guys, you know, like, <laughs> now I know who you are. <laughs> Uh, yeah. because now because it's age. it's true like yeah. there are people that That's know so one funny. song and and yeah yeah uh, so i get the resentful part of it uh, i've been there and where you're like what about the other songs that i even like better but you know mm -hmm. drops of jupiter because of how personal it is to me uh and i know so many writers that they sell their publishing every five years which yeah, makes sense yeah, yeah. because it's a it's a healthy check and there's not a lot of connection that they have with these songs mm -hmm. because they're co-writing with a room full of people or even just one artist and it's more the artist who's using the words that are important to them or whatever but mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. selling my publishing would be a very uh a very scary day yeah because yeah. Wow. my connection to these songs is you know, these are about my wife and my mom and my relationships mm -hmm. and things that my kids, I want to benefit from in the future. And like, how much money yeah. do you really need? And, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what's important? And uh, I think the way you're raised and the fact that I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania, and I could live in a car still uh, <laughs> makes it so that I'm going to be fine if I just, I just want to sing songs, man. I'm the same yeah. dumb kid that was in that car on the way back from basketball practice. But <clears throat> I think if you do have a magical song, I think there's a responsibility that you have to share it mm -hmm. live with your with your fans. <laughs> Dave, hang on a second. Okay. Oh. <sighs> You know, mm -hmm. sometimes, Dave, mm -hmm. I wonder just how clean our big city air is out here in Nash Vegas. Yeah, I feel that. You ever you, feel that? Yeah, you know something scary? Yeah. John, indoor air can yeah. be up to five times more polluted than outdoor air. What? State, no, no, no. VOCs, yeah. or say it, because I know you know it. I'm guessing it's volatile organic compounds. Yep, and some yeah. people call it volatile. Are constantly emitted indoors from thousands of common household products. Well, Dave, that's why we need Neo PX. Yeah. All right? The world's first bioengineered 
Living Purifier. That's right, Living Purifier, designed to clean the air in your home. It was invented by scientists to target the most harmful VOCs. It's up to 30 times better than a regular house plant at fighting pollution. Based on five years of research and development, the old R&D, R&D. if yep. you will, the Neo PX captures and recycles VOCs into useful matter like sugar and amino acids. Every month, you just pour the bioengineered formula called Power Drops Power into drops. the plant soil to supercharge Neo PX. Neo PX comes with a self-watering planter called the Shell. The Shell. So you only have to water it every two to three weeks. When you purchase Neo PX, you'll receive six Power Drop pouches to celebrate the launch. Neo PX is offering a seventh pouch. What? Yeah, seventh. John, how many do you? Don't think tell you me need? it's for free. It's free of charge. It's FOC. Mm -hmm. That's one extra month of pure air. Go to neoplants.com slash dadville and the code will be applied automatically at checkout. Shipping is available within the U.S. and soon to many more countries. One of the things that I think is so um, cool about you and then also Train is that, and and what's fun now, you know, having been in the music industry for 20 years um, and written songs you know, that whole time for myself and others is that I listen to music so differently now, obviously than when I did when I was 20, you know, 25 or whatever. And one of my favorite things to do is to listen to albums that I really loved back then now, because I hear them so differently because I hear them through my brain, you know, my 20 year old writing brain where I'm kind of like, Oh, that's a, I didn't realize they did that chord there or what a cool way to get out of that. And I think listen to that first train record. I was like, this is one of my favorite things to do is when you see, oh, this is a guy who knows how to write songs. Like he's just got that weird gift that we all hope we have where it's like you just kind of know like I should sing that there and this should go up here. And this sh- and there's, you know, I don't know if you knew what you were doing, but you can definitely see, you know, <clears throat> if it's like if you were a company, smart people would have been like, hey, we want to put stock in that guy, which, mm-hmm. you know, Columbia did or Aware or whatever. But it was interesting seeing that because you, you listen to that record and you're like between free and you know, Meet Virginia, there, there's songs where you're like, oh, this guy sort of gets the arc of a pop song, you know, just even though those were more acoustic and the more bandy on that record, but then, gosh, you get into the next two or three records, and I think that's where you guys are really flexing, sort of the, like, hey, we can write cool songs. In fact, I think John and I actually talked about this, because we were hanging out one of those afternoons, and I was telling him I'd listen to those records, and I was just like, it's so cool, because you guys have always managed, in my opinion, to do this really cool thing where you can write really accessible big pop songs, like you know, give the people what they want. But then you have these really cool vibey songs on the records too that, that satiate sort of the more art, artistic leaning, you know, fans that are like, give me more. But I think the thing that you've done the whole time is that I would say as much as I really think any writer alive that's an artist is you really do have a way that you write your songs that's very particular to you. Like it's not, um, and I think what's fun about that is you've been able to do it over such a long time. And one of the things, I told John I want to ask you is like, you know, I mean, you, you you guys have had hits for a long time, you know, and I think about bands that you came up with, and I mean, you know this better than I do, but I'm sure you look to the left and the right now, and you're like, there's not many of y'all still standing, much less that are having active songs, and you know, like I feel like you guys have a hit every two or three years still, which is amazing to me, and I'm curious, like, is that something? Um, like, how have you navigated that? Like, how have you thought about that? I'm just so impressed by that because I feel like that's a really hard thing to continue to do. My my manager calls it being competitive, and yeah. I call it being relevant. Mm-hmm. And mm. so whatever one is motivating to you makes the most sense. But for me, being relevant has always been important. Mm-hmm. And wow. so in the early days... You know, we, uh, the bass player that was in the original version of this band just passed away, Mm -hmm. and he really was a gifted, he was the gifted guy musically in the band. Mm -hmm. Like, he played bass guitar different than anyone I've ever heard. And there were guys that, you know, had 12 string basses who would just stand there and watch this guy play because it was so different and interesting. Yeah. Uh, And then as the band evolved and different members came in, they, if I did have a piece of advice for a young person, it would be this. We had, which I think is the biggest mistake of the band, which is we decided early days that we would only write within the band. And it's a mistake. I think if you're a young person, it's fear-based 
instead of uh, motivation where once we shifted that, uh, I remember my drummer at the time was like, hey, man, I want to get more songs on these records. How do I do it? And I said, you write songs. Like, yeah. that's the way you do it. You, yeah. don't, you don't get favors. Like, I want you to write a great song for the yeah. sake of my, like, I want to write to your great music, you know. So right. he started right. to write. And Calling All Angels was him and that bass player wow. where he was like, hey, thanks for telling me that I needed to go That's to work. So cool. And so since then, then, you know, the Save Me San Francisco album was me writing with everyone but my band. Uh-huh. And yeah. then, you know, it just, it goes on and on. So now my current band, uh, I write most of the songs with uh, my keyboard player, Jerry Becker, and my drummer, Matt Musty, <clears throat> because... Mm. They work so well together. They're writing songs every mm. single day. They're writing right now. Wow. And then they'll send me things. And then, you know, I'll hum melodies into a iPhone and send them to them. And it's just always uh, an evolution. Yeah. But I'm always interested in new music. Like, I, yeah. I have younger yeah. kids that listen to... Like, I heard this song the other day. I was like, what? How good is this song? Have you ever heard of a band called uh, Men I Trust? Yes. I mean, this is such dope music right. coming out of Montreal, Canada. Yep. And yep. like, I sent it to my daughter, and she's like, what is this? And I said, it's a band I love. She goes, yeah, I've been listening to this on TikTok for a year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like, come on, Dad. but it, it's out there. Like, yeah. There's great yeah. stuff. And the evolution and wanting to be relevant is just important. You know, speaking of yeah. TikTok, mm. I, I wanted to ask you... <laughs> How do you speak? How do you do it? Do you just log in? No, please don't. Um, (laughs) That's the rest of our interview. Just trying. How do you do it? Okay, sent me an email. Um, (laughs) I remember listening to Meet Virginia, driving to high school, (laughs) driving to school in high school, and uh, loving. I mean. This is a long winded way of me saying like you're you guys have had success spanning like however many decades at this point. And I'm curious if you feel like because of your massive success in a time where the record business, if you compare twenty twenty four and, you know, the late nineties, it's like unrecognizable. Do you feel like you have avoided having to play the game and be a chameleon and ebb and flow and change with the business because of that success? Or do you, or are you like, no, 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 we're, we're trying to chase the trends as well, just like everybody else. Yeah. Chase is not the word I would use, but definitely, you know, like TikTok is not a thing that I am, uh, naturally good at. So we, we have a girl who just started to help us a few months ago because our, uh, you know, we didn't have any content up because I'm, you know, I'm going to be 30 next year. I don't, I don't have time for that. <laughs> oh, wow. Happy birthday. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so, <laughs> you know, these kids, like my daughter are so good at TikTok. Like they're, yeah. but, but when I watch TikTok, I'm like, I don't want anything to do with that. Shit. This yes. is the most yeah. pretend I don't dance. Like, I, I don't know what, I would, and so we've figured out how to, put our personalities into these TikTok videos. And, and I think, you know, like we put a video up, I think a month ago and got 50,000 new followers in like four hours. Jeez. And it was just like, why? It didn't make any You're sense like, to me. But <laughs> Why are you guys why? following so, <laughs> What a great response. That's the dumbest thing we've ever why? heard. <laughs> and so I don't think I chase it, but yeah. I give in eventually, you know. Yeah. And it, it's like when... When I started touring, there were no cell phones, you know, like iTunes yeah, wasn't yeah. even a thought mm-hmm. and and uh, streaming wasn't, you know, close to a thought. But I always saw people of my generation and a little older complain about every new change. And I was yeah. like, man, I'm just not going to be like that. Because yeah. Yeah. all I heard them say was, how am I going to stay rich? And that wasn't yeah, that yeah. wasn't inspiring to me. Yeah, God, that's a great. That's, I will say, I, I mean, I I feel the same way. I don't want to like you look back at at you know in the '60s and the '70s. It's like every new thing, 
whoever was the old guard feels like the world is ending. And so I think this is just yeah. kind of how it goes. But, but I will say, yeah. when you get on TikTok, I do, I'm like, oh, this must not be it. What's the thing that everyone's like excited about? And they're like, no, 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 that's it. That little four second video, that, that's kind of it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's it. Yeah. I don't want to do and it. And then, you know, like kids, there's such a, an incredible avenue for success and to be an artist but it's a 30 second window yeah yeah and yeah. that is different yeah. than it's uh, you know it ever was with with my world uh yeah. and the thing that i hope tiktok can continue to do is inspire young people to want to do this because mm. we'll lose a lot of potential you know prince and tom petty's unless they find a way in Right. And find it to yeah. be uh, somewhat financially satisfying because, you know, there are a lot of smart people that could just take uh, computer science or they could make a record. And computer science, yeah. you know, there's, there's a thousand jobs and making a record is like, who knows? Uh, so yeah. the idea is just to keep people that are young engaged and thinking that there's still a chance. I think that's really important. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you said it so well, and I think that's, I mean, I, I feel, you know, I'm 45. Um, I don't know if you can tell. I, look, I couldn't look, tell at all, man. You but, look uh, good. We have filters on here. Um, but I feel I do feel like, I mean, John and I, you know, both doing this for a living, like it's a conversation we have, but it, it's, it's amazing how much that for my age group feels like that's a very common conversation with other artists our age. It's sort of like, what does it look like to keep doing this and st- you know, serve the trends, but also realize it's just not exactly our thing. And so how do you, like y'all are doing with TikTok, how do you sort of find these ways to engage, but also know there's just, I mean, I can't, every time I open, (laughs) every time I open TikTok, I just feel like a perv and I'm not even looking at it. I'm just opening it. And I feel like somebody's be like, gross. And I'm like, no, you're, that's fair. I'm closing it. I don't even (laughs) know what's happening. I'm just like, this is somebody's daughter. I don't know what's Uh, happening. I'm just trying to log in. I'm just trying to log in. (laughs) I mean, God, and the, then the hyperlink doesn't work, and then I'm buying some shirt with the Def Leppard. I don't know how I got here. Um, so here is something that um, that I wanted to ask, which is really funny because you having just talked about this, something I think, again, is so cool about Train and y'all's career is that, you, like John said, you've done it for so long. I mean, you guys have been, you know, and you said it so well. I think the thing I worry about is someone was like, what do you get nervous about with where music is going? I'm like, it's just that it's not, the industry is not creating a place for artists to be career artists right they can have unbelievable success in short amount of time but like you know when you think about what you guys have done or doing and and then it's so cool with this tour you guys are doing because knowing that you're going out playing these sheds are y'all playing sheds yep Uh yeah so you know and it's with ario speedwagon right yep and then Yacht Rock, which I would watch every opening. Me set too, man. Band. I love them so much. <laughs> I, would, I just slowly make my way on the stage. Me every too, night. man. Like, oh, Pat singing again. Yeah, he came from somewhere back in his long. But uh, it's I so feel true. like <laughs> it's right. You just they're like, I guess he's in the band now. He's quit training. And he's just doing BGVs for Kenny yeah, Loggins. They're on our cruise. Like, every cruise, they're the first band we call. Oh, yeah. Then you know the guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm curious, like, what is it like, especially in context of knowing where music is, how fast music comes and goes, to be doing a tour, one, with a band like that, you guys, sitting in front of... I was just thinking about this when we knew we were going to have you on. I was like, that's just got to be such a cool feeling to look out and see all these people singing songs that you wrote that have such big emotional ties to them, right? Like, I mean, that are remembering these wonderful parts of their lives and... That's got to be such an interesting thing about um, where you guys are and how, just how long you've done it. You know what I mean? The fact that you can have you can have a set full of songs that everybody in that crowd knows has got to be a really cool feeling, you know, to celebrate that every night on this tour, you know? My most uh, favorite accomplishment is that hmm. when we do shows, uh, no matter how big or small, there are families out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love that. there are grandparents memory. and their grandkids, and they're all dancing and singing, and they know the songs. And I just, you know, I curse a lot in my regular life, but I don't bring it to work because <laughs> I, I want everybody to re- bring you know, really have a, a great time. Yeah. Um, and That's it, it's funny because I really do, I swear a lot. And I was uh, at my kid's school. 
doing a songwriters class and there's like a dozen oh, a yeah. dozen kids. Oh, that's so cool. And so after 10 minutes I looked at the teacher and the kids and I said, <laughs> "This is the longest I've gone without cursing since I was <laughs> 9." <laughs> and, and so at the end of the songwriting thing the teacher sends me an email, "Thank you so much for being there. You can go back to cursing." <laughs> <laughs> As you were, they're like Pat. We noticed you were sweating a lot. Were you nervous? You're like, no, I wasn't nervous. Holding I was just withholding I was myself, trying so hard not to say mother. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I think those moments are really hard to beat. Yeah. And yeah. I always tell people, like, look, if you're not coming out to see Ario Speedwagon and Train and Yacht Rock Review this year, go see something. Because man, mm. I didn't yeah. get to see Petty. I didn't get to see Prince. Yeah, there yeah, are things yeah, that all yeah. of a sudden are, for whatever reason, John Bon Jovi mm. has been through hell yeah. with his vocal cords. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. go see whatever you can see if mm. it inspires you because, you know, these yeah. things aren't forever. They aren't. You're right. It's crazy, too. Like, this is something that really messes with my brain when you realize that we are literally we've been losing that sort of first class of rock for the last 10 years mm-hmm. and that's the first time in the world that's happened where a yeah. music pop music is only so old and we've just started to yeah. lose and they're gone it's right. like when they're gone they're gone i mean their music isn't mm-hmm. but the ability to see them live is um which really oh, no. messes my brain cuz you feel like these people are eternal yeah. you're like no like you know paul mccartney's going to be here for 500 years and it's like you know his music will yeah. but he's not right you that's know? right that's a great point. So we end these interviews with a little speed round. So, uh, and you can curse as much as you want during the speed round. Not speed the drug. Just to, right. We no. just ask yeah, questions. Yeah. That's so too worry that if you didn't bring any speed. <laughs> That's a shame. That's a shame. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to start us off. What's your most wonderfully awful on stage moment that you can remember? Um, I told a joke in Pittsburgh once. And I love how was, you just had this locked and loaded. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it was such a dumb joke, but I was incapable of relating to this audience. It was also a shed in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm from Erie, so I figured, yeah. you know, these yeah, are my yeah, people. These are people. And I don't even remember what the joke was, but it was about some girl backstage, and the whole place just looked at me like, "Oh my God, I want you to die," <laughs> and. I was like, not more than I want myself to die. Yeah. Like, this is the worst moment. And I remember even the guys in my band looked at me like, I want you to die. Like, it was really bad. Everybody but you. It may be and maybe you. me. <laughs> it was bad. I'll never forget that moment. And my second amazing. worst is we, oh. we uh, did a co-headline tour with Maroon 5, and the first night we closed, and they whooped our Mm. so bad and i sat in my dressing room for four hours by myself afterwards and wouldn't let anybody in and the next the next time we smoked everybody we were so because because it was like i need to go through this yeah because i know what we need to change and we changed everything i mean everything we did we flipped uh, and I'm not saying we smoked them. I'm just saying we never, we yeah, never had yeah, that moment yeah, again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those moments on tour. John actually did this one time where we did a show. We did a co-headline. This is a million years ago, and I still look back at it. We uh, was it Wake Forest? Wake Forest yeah. we I'll never right? forget one of the and greatest we each moments played. And I, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was like I still have shame about that night because like i didn't rehearse the band i was like it's gonna be fun let's get there and rip and run yeah. and john was in the middle of like a nine-year tour <laughs> where they had done a set fifty thousand uh-huh. times and we kind of got done and we sort of bobbled a couple things and then they got up there and it was like the most well done i mean it's three songs in, i was like oh i've made a terrible mistake i mean it was just like so frustrating and those nights but they're good for it. it's like you said yep. pat like you kind of go okay this i is needed to do. get my booked that day and it, it yep. was big yep. yeah um i like that you may have just also said plural which i don't i'm not going to ask about that's that but it does interest just, me um okay he was so young. um <laughs> <laughs> so uh second question Th- this is a new question that john and i'm really excited about but knowing that your dad was in music um, we've never asked this, and I'm super excited to hear your response. What is the song that reminds you of your dad? 
Boy, there's a lot of them. Uh, you know, for some reason, I think it would be Chet Baker's My oh, wow. Funny Valentine. Mm-hmm. Oh, what what a song. And what the way song. he sings it and his love for oh. Chet Baker and how uh, tortured Chet was. And like, mm-hmm. man, that uh, all that reminds me of my dad. I love Chet yeah, Baker. Yeah, that's so cool. All right. Uh, let's see here. I, Dave, it looks like you've uh, you've altered this one. Did, we I usually ask, added one. who would you have dinner with? Oh, that's right. That's right. But yeah. with this one, we're changing it. We're doing a lot of firsts for you, Pat. Uh, who, what's, you. Who, who have you had dinner with that you were like, this is one of my, like, if I were making plaques of people I've had dinner with, I would put a plaque with <laughs> this person's name on it. You know, years ago, before I was married to my wife, she was my girlfriend. We were on the Howard Stern show, and uh, it was so fun. She came in because she is incredibly beautiful, and that's the way he does it. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's the way he does it. And afterwards, <laughs> uh, Howard called me, and he was like, hey, can you and Amber have dinner with me and Beth? And he and Beth weren't married either, and uh, we just had the best time and have had mm. dinner since and uh the he's just a really like one of my favorite people i've ever met mm. that's so cool i bet that guy's got some amazing stories too i've been invited to a dinner one time that jeff bridges was supposed to be at but i couldn't make it and that would have been my number yeah. two yeah, yeah. jeff yep. bridges is yep. so cool yeah the coolest i partied one night with dennis quaid that was one of the weirdest times of my life <laughs> It is just <laughs> absolutely like weirdest. nuts. Dennis Quaid. <laughs> that would be that'd be pretty amazing. Um, okay, um, I just added this, one, but I but I, but you know, I was just selfish when I ask ask it quickly. What is your favorite song you've written? Um, it's always going to be "Drops of Jupiter." I mean, really, yeah, just uh, I love it's that. too That's it's so too cool. important to you know losing your for a boy to lose his mom mm-hmm. that's a that's a big thing but the healing that comes from writing about it that's uh yeah there's you know yeah. it's it, yeah. it's funny watching uh, a big family mourn differently yeah, yeah. and my mourning yeah. was yeah. quick mm. because yeah. i felt okay you know it was a really mm. and i think i've always been looked down upon by some of my mm. siblings because I was okay so mm. quick. Yeah. All right, last question. Pat, thank you so much. You've been awesome. Uh, if you wrote a book about being a dad, what would the title be? If I wrote a book about being a dad, it would just be called Good Luck. Good Luck. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah. so great. That's a great. You should do Good that. luck. <laughs> Have at it. Well, Pat, I will tell you good luck. Thank you so much oh, thank for you guys. hanging. Yeah, this, this is, has been great. You're the best. This was awesome, a lot of fun. Awesome. Go, and, and for those who are listening, go see the tour this summer. It's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. I'd love to be in your uh, physical presence. So if you'd like to come out to the Nashville show, we'd love to have you. We'd love to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Heck cool. yeah. I introduce you God, to the God. Yacht Rock guys. There we go. Dude, you, you, you keep me off the stage. Man, they're right. so I'm good. wear a keep white suit to that show. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Man, it's so good. Nobody knows the words. You don't have to. You don't have to know the words. Dum, dum, dum.